Chapter Fifteen of The Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsty. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stendhal, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Fifteen: The Cock Song. Amour en latin factamo, ou donc provion d'amour la ma, et, pas avant, celui qui mourait. De, plus, piège, fauffards, remords. Blason d'amour. If Julien had possessed a little of that adroitness on which he so gratuitously plumed himself, he could have congratulated himself the following day on the effect produced by his journey to Verrieres. His absence had caused his clumsiness to be forgotten, but on that day also he was rather sulky. He had a ludicrous idea in the evening, and with singular courage he communicated it to Madame de Renal. They had scarcely sat down in the garden before Julien brought his mouth near Madame de Renal's ear without waiting till it was sufficiently dark, and at the risk of compromising her terribly, said to her, Madame, to-night, at two o'clock, I shall go into your room, I must tell you something. Julien trembled lest his request should be granted. His rakish pose weighed him down so terribly that if he could have followed his own inclination, he would have returned to his room for several days and refrained from seeing the ladies any more. He realised that he had spoiled by his clever conduct of last evening all the bright prospects of the day that had just passed, and was at his wit's end what to do. Madame de Renal answered the impertinent declaration which Julien had dared to make to her with indignation, which was real and in no way exaggerated. He thought he could see contempt in her curt reply. The expression, for shame, had certainly occurred in that whispered answer. Julien went to the children's room under the pretext of having something to say to them, and on his return he placed himself beside Madame Derville, and very far from Madame de Renal. He thus deprived himself of all possibility of taking her hand. The conversation was serious, and Julien acquitted himself very well, apart from a few moments of silence during which he was cudgelling his brains. Why can't I invent some pretty manoeuvre, he said to himself, which will force Madame de Renal to vouchsafe to me those unambiguous signs of tenderness which a few days ago made me think that she was mine? Julien was extremely disconcerted by the almost desperate plight to which he had brought his affairs. Nothing, however, would have embarrassed him more than success. When they separated at midnight, his pessimism made him think that he enjoyed Madame Derville's contempt, and that he probably stood no better with Madame de Renal. Feeling in a very bad temper and very humiliated, Julien did not sleep. He was leagues away from the idea of giving up all intriguing and planning, and of living from day to day with Madame de Renal, and of being contented like a child with the happiness brought by every day. He racked his brains, inventing clever manoeuvres, which an instant afterwards he found absurd, and, to put it shortly, was very unhappy when two o'clock rang from the castle clock. The noise woke him up like the cock's crow woke up St. Peter. The most painful episode was now time to begin. He had not given a thought to his impertinent proposition, since the moment when he had made it, and it had been so badly received. I have told her that I will go to her at two o'clock, he said to himself as he got up. I may be inexperienced and coarse, as the son of a peasant naturally would be. Madame Derville has given me to understand as much, but at any rate I will not be weak. Julien had reason to congratulate himself on his courage, for he had never put his self-control to so painful a test. As he opened his door, he was trembling to such an extent that his knees gave way under him, and he was forced to lean against the wall. He was without shoes. He went and listened at Monsieur de Renal's door, and could hear his snoring. He was disconsolate. He had no longer any excuse for not going to her room. But great heaven, what was he to do there? He had no plan, and even if he had had one, he felt himself so nervous that he would have been incapable of carrying it out. 
Eventually, suffering a thousand times more than if he had been walking to his death, he entered the little corridor that led to Madame de Renal's room. He opened the door with a trembling hand and made a frightful noise. There was light. A night light was burning on the mantelpiece. He had not expected this new misfortune. As she saw him enter, Madame de Renal got quickly out of bed. Wretch! she cried. There was a little confusion. Julien forgot his useless plans and turned to his natural role. To fail to please so charming a woman appeared to him the greatest of misfortunes. His only answer to her reproaches was to throw himself at her feet while he kissed her knees. As she was speaking to him with extreme harshness, he burst into tears. When Julien came out of Madame de Renal's room, some hours afterwards, one could have said, adopting the conventional language of the novel, that there was nothing left to be desired. In fact, he owed to the love he had inspired, and to the unexpected impression which her alluring charms had produced upon him, a victory to which his own clumsy tactics would never have led him. But victim that he was of a distorted pride, he pretended, even in the sweetest moments, to play the role of a man accustomed to the subjugation of women. He made incredible but deliberate efforts to spoil his natural charm. Instead of watching the transports which he was bringing into existence, and those pangs of remorse which only set their keenness into fuller relief, the idea of duty was continually before his eyes. He feared a frightful remorse and eternal ridicule if he departed from the ideal model he proposed to follow. In a word, the very quality which made Julien into a superior being was precisely that which prevented him from savouring the happiness which was placed within his grasp. It's like the case of a young girl of sixteen, with a charming complexion, who is mad enough to put on rouge before going to a ball. Mortally terrified by the apparition of Julien, Madame de Renal was soon a prey to the most cruel alarm. The prayers and despair of Julien troubled her keenly. Even when there was nothing left for her to refuse him, she pushed Julien away from her with a genuine indignation, and straight away threw herself into his arms. There was no plan apparent in all this conduct. She thought herself eternally damned, and tried to hide from herself the sight of hell by loading Julien with the wildest caresses. In a word, nothing would have been lacking in our hero's happiness. Not even an ardent sensibility in the woman whom he had just captured, if he had only known how to enjoy it. Julien's departure did not in any way bring an end to those ecstasies which thrilled her in spite of herself, and those troubles of remorse which lacerated her. My God, being happy, being loved, is that all it comes to? This was Julien's first thought as he entered his room. He was a prey to the astonishment and nervous anxiety of the man who has just obtained what he has long desired. He has been accustomed to desire, and has no longer anything to desire, and nevertheless has no memories. Like a soldier coming back from parade, Julien was absorbed in rehearsing the details of his conduct. Have I failed in nothing which I owe to myself? Have I played my part well? And what a part! The part of a man accustomed to be brilliant with women. End of chapter 15 The Cock's Song Recording by Kirsty.